something wonderfully magical is in the air, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're feeling it here in this arena, but it's spreading all across this country we love. A familiar feeling that's been buried too deep for far too long. You know what I'm talking about. It's the contagious power of hope. The anticipation, the energy, the exhilaration of once again being on the cusp of a brighter day. The chance to vanquish the demons of fear, division, and hate that have consumed us and continue pursuing the unfinished promise of this great nation, the dream that our parents and grandparents fought and died and sacrificed for. America, hope is making a comeback. <laughs> This is my video update on this Wednesday afternoon, August the 21st. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with the DNC. And we had the Obamas speaking at the DNC in Chicago, their hometown. We had uh, Biden speak the other day. And Biden gave his farewell address to America, to the world. Goodbye, Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son. Goodbye. Biden gave his farewell address. It was a very dark Brandon farewell speech from Bidenopoulos. Biden said that, that Russia and Putin wanted to capture Ukraine in three days. And then an angry Biden, a dark brand, had said, Ukraine is free. <laughs> Putin failed. Ukraine is free. That is what dark Brandon told everyone in Chicago as they watched his farewell address, which was, which was uh, aired very late at night, I believe 1130, 12 o'clock. That must have been a difficult speech for, for Biden to give. Everyone in attendance clapped. We love you, Joe. We love you, Joe. You, you prevented Russia from capturing Kiev in three days. <laughs> We're never going to hear, hear the end of that story, are we? Russia wanted to capture Ukraine in three days, but Alensky prevented that. Biden prevented Russia from capturing Ukraine in three freaking days, man. With 40,000 troops... Russia was going to capture all of Ukraine in three days, according to Mark Milley. That's the lie spun by Mark Milley, which, which we are never going to hear the end of, <laughs> unfortunately. Anyway, that was uh, Biden. So you have Biden, the, the president that was cooed. He gives his, his speech very late at night where most people are not going to probably stay up to, to watch Biden give a speech. And, uh, and then you have the, the people who allegedly masterminded the coup. Allegedly masterminded the coup. You had Pelosi in attendance, but you have uh, the Obamas giving their speech. So you have the coup president. Then you have the, the Obamas who allegedly, allegedly masterminded the coup against Biden. And, uh, and then you're going to have Kamala Harris speaking. I like the, the way everything was lined up, huh? Biden, then the Obamas, and then Harris, who, who the Obamas chose to, to succeed Biden post-coup. Allegedly, the Obamas chose Harris to succeed Biden post-coup. So yeah, the, uh, the Obamas, they spoke in Chicago. And Michelle Obama, she said that hope is making a comeback. Something new is in the air. Can, can you feel it, everybody? 
Can you feel that something new? Someone, that someone new. That someone is hope and change 2.0. That someone is Kamala Harris. Hope is making a comeback. <laughs> Never mind that Kamala Harris was vice president for three and a half, four years alongside Biden. Just forget about all of that. We're talking about hope and change 2.0. The Obama's fourth term if uh, Harris wins in November. <laughs> anyway, that was the... Uh, the DNC. And uh, on the Trump side of things, we are getting reports that RFK may be about to drop out of the race and endorse Trump. And the reports are that RFK is going to, to take a position in the Trump White House where he would be in charge of Trump's overall health uh, policy, which would be a very, a very good position. For RFK, I must admit, but um, his his running mate Nicole uh, Shanahan, I believe, is her name Nicole Shanahan. Yeah, she uh, she was giving an interview the other day, and uh, she said she pretty much said that the RFK uh, campaign has two choices: either stay in the race and then build a new party, which is going to be extremely difficult. Or they could drop out of the race and, and just fold into Trump's campaign. And for them, it's important. Check out that lizard. Little tiny lizard. For the RFK campaign, what Nicole uh, Shanahan said, it's important for them to, to consider joining the Trump campaign. The reason being that, uh, that according to, to her statement, they're pulling a lot of votes away from, from Trump. At least that's how they're seeing it. If they stay in the race, it might actually damage Trump's chances of winning. And so if they join forces with Trump, they can prevent a Harris Waltz White House. That is pretty much what, uh, what she said in this radio interview. So that would be interesting. RFK as, as the health czar under a Trump administration and Trump also offered a position to Elon Musk. He hinted at some sort of Elon Musk position in his administration. And Elon Musk, I believe, he was very positive to, to working in the Trump administration. I don't know as what, but, you know, Elon Musk has, has a lot of interesting ideas, I guess. And that would be quite an asset to have on, on your team. So that's what's going on from the Trump side of things. Going back to Biden, we have a New York Times report which claims that Biden approved secret, a secret nuclear strategy to take on China, Russia, and North Korea. A new, a refocused nuclear strategy to take on the axis of evil. <laughs> they wanted to capture Kiev in three days, in Ukraine, in three days. But Ukraine is still free, said Biden. <laughs> yeah, Ukraine is really free. Yeah, absolutely. They're banning the, the Orthodox Church. They've banned media. They've banned political parties. Alensky's an illegitimate president, according to the Ukraine Constitution and according to Russian lawyers and Russian experts who have studied the constitution of Ukraine. Alensky's illegitimate. He canceled elections. They're grabbing people uh, off the streets and throwing them in vans and then tossing them to, to the front lines, throwing them to the front lines. Uh, Ukraine is putting out advertisements to encourage women to, to go to the front lines. Yeah, re real free, v very, very free Ukraine. Absolutely. Ukraine hasn't been free since the 2000 and 14 coup, and maybe even before that, Ukraine has not been free because Newland has been meddling in Ukraine since, since when? 2002, 2003? Ukraine lost its freedom, absolutely lost its freedom with the Maidan coup d'etat where John McCain 
was in Kiev speaking to to the crowds gathered in uh, the Maidan Square, talking about freedom and democracy. Freedom and democracy that the U.S. could give to Ukraine, right? Here's a, here's a post from Lee Zeldin. Kamala Harris becomes the first candidate to become a major party presidential nominee without receiving even a single vote, without putting even a single policy on a website, without standing for even a single press conference, or without sitting for even a single interview. Democracy, everybody. Democracy in action. This is the democracy that was, that was gifted to Ukraine in 2014. So the New York Times is saying that Biden, he, uh, he changed up the U.S.'s nuclear strategy. It's so secret, according to the New York Times, that there are no documents, no documents, no papers, uh, nothing when it comes to, to the refocus of, uh, of the U.S.'s nuclear strategy because it has to be kept absolutely super duper top secret. So uh, Biden, he, he is changing the strategy, according to the New York Times, or he has changed the strategy back in March, according to the New York Times, to take on Russia, China, and North Korea, which would be nuclear Armageddon. I mean, you know, the United States in, uh, in some sort of a nuclear showdown with China, Russia, and North Korea. Yeah, that's, that's the end of all of us. That is the end of all of us. Isn't it interesting that for the last three years, it has been the collective West, the Biden White House, that has been going on and on and on about how Russia is a nuclear threat and Russia is going to, to change their nuclear strategy so that uh, they, can, they can push the world towards some sort of nuclear showdown. And, and they've been telling us this for three years. Russia's a nuclear threat. But it now turns out that it was all projection because back in March, it was actually the Biden White House and the United States that was changing up the, their nuclear doctrines and their nuclear strategy so that, they can, so that they can take us even closer to some sort of a nuclear showdown between the West and China and Russia and North Korea as well. So that is what the New York Times reported. And... Let's, let's go to Ukraine. Let's talk about Ukraine. We had an interesting post from a parliament member. Bezugla is her name. And she posted this. Our units are being withdrawn from there. When she says there, she's talking about the Donbass. Our units are being withdrawn from the Donbass, leaving entire strips of the front to their own devices. Ammunition is not being added. The Russians are passing through empty fortifications. In such circumstances, the surrender of Bakrovsk is a matter of the near future and Toretsk is ending its last days. That's quite a post from this parliament member. Basically, this person is saying, this member of parliament in Ukraine is saying that Alensky has, has thrown so many resources in the direction of Kursk and trying to hold on to Kursk that the Donbass is, is left empty. Empty of, or, or is being left empty, let's say is being left empty of soldiers, ammunition, tanks, vehicles, military hardware resources, it's being abandoned. That's, that's what I get from reading this uh, post. That Alensky is basically saying Donbass is, is lost. My only shot of coming out of this, this conflict in one piece is to continue to push this Kursk operation narrative, Kursk invasion narrative of Russia. So that's an interesting post from Bezugla. I don't know if this is true. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe she's aligned with one of the, the other um, oligarchs in Ukraine or other politicians, maybe Poroshenko. Actually, I think, I think this person may be aligned with Poroshenko now that I think about it. 
So maybe this is some, some kind of way to, to damage uh, Elensky by saying that he's abandoning the Donbass and he's focused on this ridiculous Kursk thing. And so uh, it's time to remove uh, Elensky and, and put in Poroshenko. I don't know, something like that could be taking place. Who knows? But maybe, maybe she's, uh, she's saying the truth. And we're going to see uh, a quick collapse in Toretsk, in Pakrovsk, in the entire Donbass. I don't know, but I just thought it was an interesting post. A lot of people are talking about this, uh, this post from Bezugla. Staying with Kursk, the, uh, the Russian foreign ministry, they actually summoned a U.S. embassy official, not the U.S. ambassador to Russia, a U.S. embassy official at the, uh, the U.S. embassy in Moscow. They summoned this official to the foreign ministry. And uh, basically, Russia, Russia told uh, this U.S. embassy official that, that they're very upset at the fact that the United States, they have journalists embedded with the Ukraine military in Kursk. And that U.S. mercenaries are operating in Kursk. Journalists and mercenaries, U.S. journalists and mercenaries are in Russian territory, a violation of Russia's sovereignty. And the journalists, according to, to what we know from, from this meeting at the Russian foreign ministry, uh, actually a CNN journalist to be more, more specific, uh, this, uh, this journalist is operating in Russia, in Russian territory, helping Ukraine spread uh, propaganda, anti-Russian, pro-Ukrainian propaganda. And this is the complaint that Russia handed over to this U.S. official. Russia condemned provocative actions of both American journalists and U.S. mercenaries spotted on Russian territory in the context of the Kursk invasion. The foreign ministry in the meeting with U.S. embassy Chief of Mission Stephanie Holmes issued strong protest in connection to the provocative actions of American reporters who illegally entered the Kursk region to produce propaganda for covering up the crimes of the Kiev regime. The ministry pointed to evidence that has emerged of the participation of American private military companies on the side of the Ukrainian armed forces during the offensive into Russia. So yeah, you have uh, U.S. journalists and U.S. mercenaries inside of Russian territory right now, operating inside of Russian territory. That's huge when you think about it. That is absolutely huge. But what makes this story interesting to me is that the Russian embassy, they didn't summon the ambassador of the United States to Russia. They summoned a U.S. official or a U.S. official attended this, this meeting as this complaint was filed. So this, this may be, a, this may signal, this may signal or hint at, at the narrative that, that Russia is, at this moment in time is, is not too bothered with, uh, with Elensky continuing to send military forces, the collective West, the collective West continuing to send military forces uh, into Kursk to be annihilated by the Russian military. Maybe this reinforces the whole trap uh, narrative of Kursk, because if they really took issue with, with the U.S. presence in Kursk, like if they were very, very upset and furious with the United States and what it's doing in Kursk, wouldn't they have summoned the, the U.S. ambassador and drawn a lot of attention to to the fact that journalists and mercenaries are in Kursk by summoning the U.S. ambassador instead of a, a U.S. official. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I just found it interesting that, that yeah, they are filing a complaint, but they're not giving it to the, to the top person at the embassy. It seems like they're not making a big stink about it. Yeah, they're upset. Yeah, they're pissed off that CNN is is reporting from Kursk. Yes, they're pissed off that U.S. mercenaries are operating in Kursk. Absolutely. 
absolutely they're pissed off about this, so they're going to file a complaint. But keep on feeding those those mercenaries and and the NATO weapons and the Ukraine soldiers. Keep on keep on feeding them into this Kursk trap. So I thought that was an interesting story. And uh, Alensky, Alensky, he had a meeting with, with ambassadors, Ukrainian ambassadors on Monday. And Alensky basically told the US ambassadors that they need to, to continue to push West, Western countries to provide long range missiles to Ukraine. According to Alensky, if Ukraine had long-range missiles, they would not have needed to go into Kursk because they would have been able to strike at Russia from a distance. But because the collective West has not allowed Ukraine to use long-range missiles into pre-2014 Russian territory, Alensky was forced to invade Russia, to strike inside of Russia with this Kursk operation. This is what Alensky told these Ukrainian ambassadors. If our partners lifted all the current restrictions on the use of weapons on Russian territory, we would not need to physically enter, particularly the Kursk region, to protect our Ukrainian citizens in the border communities, the Ukrainian leader insisted. He went on to lament that for now, we cannot use all the weapons at our disposal and eliminate Russian terrorists where they are. Alensky also called on Kiev's Western backers not to fear a potential escalation from Moscow. He cited Russia's supposed inability to defend its territory after Kiev crossed the strictest of all the red lines that Russia has. That's a direct quote. According to Alensky, this proves that all of Moscow's other red lines are also illusory. It's all an illusion. Russia's red lines are just an illusion. So don't worry, collective West. Don't worry about a Russian retaliation. Don't worry about Russia's nuclear capabilities. We've crossed, according to Alensky, we've crossed the strictest of red lines. We are invading Russia at this moment. We are occupying Russia at this very moment, and according to Alensky, Russia hasn't done anything or anything severe. So don't worry, Collective West. Give us permission to use attackums and storm shadows and any other long-range missiles to hit deep inside of Russian territory. Do not fear about a Russian response. That is the message that Alensky is giving to his ambassadors so that his ambassadors could go back to their country and relay this message to the leaders of the collective West. Alensky, Alensky, he is, he is playing a very dangerous game. A very dangerous game. Alensky's hoping for a retaliation. That's what, that's what it feels like to me. It feels like Alensky is trying to goad Russia into a very heavy retaliation. The type of retaliation that will prompt some sort of NATO intervention. That's, that's what it feels like. It, it seems like his, the, the, the first goal, the first, uh, the first Hail Mary that the collective West threw in order to try and, and come out of this, uh, this Ukraine conflict with some sort of a, of a win was trying to, to seize the Kursk nuclear power plant. So that has failed. And now it seems like Alensky, he is, he is trying to goad Russia into, into some sort of very heavy retaliation against Ukraine, which would then prompt a NATO intervention or a U.S. intervention. And uh, that would be the way that, that he gets out of this mess, given that the Kursk goal was, was thwarted. And Bloomberg, Bloomberg is saying that Russia and Ukraine can't mount major offensives against each other. Bloomberg is calling it a stalemate. They are reporting that, that Ukraine is, is now operating in Kursk and they're not capable to do anything more than, than what you're seeing in Kursk. And 
Russia, Russia has captured the territory that, they're, that they've captured and they're unable to do anything either. Russia is now just, uh, just engaged in a war of attrition, according to Bloomberg. And that's all that Russia can do. <laughs> that, is, that is how Bloomberg sees it. They're, they're obsessed with territory. They're absolutely obsessed with taking territory. Who is taking more territory? That defines who's winning. And according to Bloomberg, because Russia is, is in a war of attrition at the moment and they are, they're unable to, to capture territory quickly, it's a stalemate. I wonder if Bloomberg has, uh, has thought about what happens when this war of attrition wipes out the entirety of Ukraine's military and then Russia can just kind of stroll into whatever, whatever towns and villages and cities they want. Has Bloomberg thought about that? <laughs> maybe, maybe a better goal than taking territory is actually wiping out the other side's military so that you can then take whatever, whatever territory you want to take. I don't know. That, that seems to be a more, more rational, more logical way of, of waging this type of war. The way that Russia is waging it seems to be a better option than trying to, to capture territory at the expense of, of the lives of your, of your soldiers, which is the formula that Ukraine has been using. So anyway, that's a Bloomberg. That is what they're reporting. And one more story, and then we'll get to our clown world or an update, an update on what is happening with Iran's retaliation. We are getting word now that Iran's retaliation is going to take some time. That is what, uh, what the Revolutionary Guard actually is saying, that their response to, to Israel might actually take a couple of months. So... The whole, uh, the whole waiting around for Iran's retaliation. Stop waiting. It's going to happen probably in October or November. And uh, this is a bad sign for the collective. West. This is a bad sign for everybody, actually, for the entire Middle East. Because it, it means that Iran is preparing for war. This is not going to be a, a one-off retaliation. Iran is getting all their, all their pieces in place. So that when the retaliation does happen, they're prepared for what's going to be the Israeli-U.S. Uh, collective West retaliation against Iran. So it looks like Iran is, is preparing for, for a big war. This is not a good sign that, uh, that it's going to take a while for Iran to retaliate. They're in preparation mode. Anyway, that's the update there. Blinken is in the Middle East. He's trying to, to get a ceasefire in Gaza. He's failing. Netanyahu is, is not interested in the ceasefire. And uh, Hamas, I don't think Hamas attended any of the, of the talks that, uh, that are taking place in the Middle East. So Blinken, once again, on his 10th trip, he's been to, to the Middle East, what, 10, 11 times? He's failed every single time. Not that... Not that Blinken really wanted to succeed, huh? I imagine this trip is kind of a two-part trip. The first part is trying to get a ceasefire, because if the U.S. can get a ceasefire, then they can, then they can uh, put the narrative out there that, that Iran has no reason to retaliate because there's a ceasefire in Gaza. So if Iran does retaliate, well, then, you know, it's all on them. It's all their fault because... We've got a ceasefire in Gaza. Why did you retaliate Iran? Why did you create trouble in the Middle East right when, right when we got a ceasefire? And that's the kind of the first, the first reason for, for Blinken's trip to the Middle East. That's the first goal that he's trying to, to accomplish, which he has failed. And the second, the second goal of, of Blinken in the Middle East is, I imagine, to tell Israel that whatever happens, we've, uh, we've got your back. So, so I imagine it's, it's a two-part trip for uh, Blinken. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the update there. And let's do a clown world. And this clown world, we go back to Dark Brandon. And the DNC and Brandon, and Biden and Brandon, and Bidenopolis, he, uh, he said during his speech that 
Trump left NATO in tatters. <laughs> tatters, I tell you. That is what Brandon said. He said, Trump left NATO in tatters. No joke. Biden said, it's no joke. Trump left NATO in tatters. And then, and then Biden said that it took him a hundred, a hundred and ninety hours of work to put NATO back together. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, okay, uh, <laughs> Biden, <laughs> you, you put 190 hours of work into, into uh, uniting NATO again. I don't think Biden has worked a total of 190 hours in the last four years of, of being president of the United States. Has he actually clocked in uh, 190 hours of, of real work? I don't think so. He claims 190 hours of work calling up NATO allies and getting them to, to unite again after Trump left NATO in tatters. Let me play you the, the speech. When Trump left office, Europe and NATO was in tatters. Not a joke. America first doctrine changed our whole image in the world. Well, I spent, they gave the hours, about 190 hours, some total. Me and my counterparts were heads of state in Europe to strengthen NATO. We did. We united Europe like it hadn't been united for years adding Finland and Sweden to NATO. <laughs> Ten days before he died, Henry Kissinger called and said, not since, not since Napoleon has Europe not looked over their shoulder at Russia with dread until now, until now. Well, guess what? Putin thought he'd take Kyiv in three days. Three years later, Ukraine is still free. So that was Dark Brandon. His final speech, most likely his final speech. Say goodbye to Bidenopolis, everybody. And that is my video, thedoran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Pick up some merch like the limited edition t-shirt I am wearing today, or maybe a hat. Maybe a hat as well. Take care.